Hi, this is Chris again with Nightfall Audiobooks, and this time I have a point horror novel by R.L. Stein. This is The Babysitter. I read most of this book, and I never got back to it, so I know how it begins. I don't know the middle or the end, really. This is from my personal collection. It will be read to you from the page, so if you hear any crinkling or you know, pages ruffling or things like that. I can't do anything really about that. It's a relatively short novel. It's around 170 pages, so this shouldn't take us too long to read. I think it's very important that we get outside of Shady Side and off of Fear Street and stuff, and we read something a little bit different. If you like the Point Horror series, I recommend Blind Date and The Snowman, also by R.L. Stein. Those are fantastic. Blind Date is R.L. Stein's first YA horror novel, and it's awesome, so please check it out. The Babysitter will be starting a new Halloween trend. This will be your Monday Halloween novel for the next four years. There are four of these, so this will be Halloween 2024, Babysitter 2 will be 2025, Babysitter 3 will be 2026, and Babysitter 4 will be 2027. Yes, I am really planning that far in advance, it's something to look forward to, like how I did Silent Night when I first started the show in 2022. So Silent Night was your Christmas episode in 2022, Silent Night 2 was your Christmas episode for 2023, and Silent Night 3 was your 2024 Christmas show. So let's get started. If you want to get in touch with me, you can write me an email, nightfallaudiobooks at gmail.com. I'm also on YouTube at Nightfall Audiobooks. Feel free to like, comment, and subscribe. Some of my favorite books were recommended by someone in the comment section. And that's how I got The Rich Girl. That was great. So it's a secret bedroom. That was wonderful. So make comments. I love reading what you have to say. So tell your friends, tell your mom, tell whoever you think would like to listen to me, tell them tales from R.L. Stein. And let's get started. Welcome to a Nightfall Audiobooks production of The Babysitter by R.L. Stein, a point horror novel, book three. Chapter one. Jenny stared at her reflection in a dark window glass as the bus squealed around a corner and headed up North Road. Dark houses and trees rushed past in the night. She examined her face in the window, her round, black eyes catching a sparkle from a streetlight and reflecting it back. She liked the way she looked in the glass, so smooth, so calm, so cool. The bus slowed for a stop sign. What was that animal darting through the hedges? Was it a deer? No, just a rock. Don't start seeing things, Jenny, she told herself, laughing at her vivid imagination. She was always trying to make the world more interesting than it was. Hey, I don't think you've heard a word I'm saying. Laura's voice broke into her thoughts. Jenny turned quickly from the window and smiled guiltily at her friend beside her on the bus seat. Lara had been talking non-stop, mostly about boys, as usual, and Jenny, lost in her own thoughts, had practically forgotten she was there. Sorry, guess I'm just nervous. It was nice of you to ride part way with me. I know, Lara said. So what are you nervous about? It isn't like you haven't babysat before. I don't know. I guess it's just new people, a strange house, a strange neighborhood. There's a lot I could worry about if I really put my mind to it. That was supposed to be a joke, but Laura didn't laugh. They'd been friends so long they didn't have to laugh at each other's jokes. Jenny glanced at her watch. It was already 7.10. She didn't want to be late on her first night. The bus hit a deep pothole and both girls nearly bounced off the plastic bus seat. Jenny leaned forward to retrieve her book bag, which had tumbled onto the floor. Maybe the kid's a monster, Jenny said, somehow feeling that she had to justify her nervousness. Maybe the parents are weird. Maybe they belong in some sort of secret cult, and when I find out about it, they keep me locked up in the basement for the rest of my life, so I can't tell anyone. Maybe the house is haunted. There's the ghost of a young girl trapped in the attic, and I accidentally let her out, and she inhabits my body, and I'm not the same person anymore. Possible. Very possible, Laura said thoughtfully. She was used to Jenny's wild imagination. She didn't even bother being sarcastic about it anymore. What was the point? There is no way to stop Jenny from dreaming up the crazy thing she did. Hey, isn't that Bob Tanner? Laura cried, pointing out the window. Where? That guy, raking the leaves in the dark. 
Lara reached past Jenny and struggled to pull up the bus window. It was stuck and she only managed to raise it an inch. Hey, Bob. Bob. Hi, she shouted through the narrow opening. Jenny looked to the front of the bus to see if the other three passengers were staring at them. They were. Hey, Bob. Look up. Hi, Bob. Why did Lara always have to embarrass her? Because she was Lara. She didn't care about what other people thought. She always did what she felt like. Jenny wished she could be more like that. Less thoughtful, less timid, more impulsive. She thought that since they spent so much time together, maybe some of Lara's boldness would rub off on her, but it didn't seem to. Sometimes Jenny wished she could look like Lara, too. Lara was so tiny, so light, so perfect. She was the shortest girl in a sophomore class, but that was certainly no handicap because she was also the most beautiful. She had cheekbones like a model, and curly, straw-colored hair that fell down to her shoulders like a waterfall. She had sky-blue eyes and creamy white skin and a tiny red heart-shaped mouth. Needless to say, Lara was very popular. She could go out with a different guy every night of the week if she wanted, and she usually wanted. Jenny felt terribly plain next to Lara. She was of average height, which made her nearly a head taller than Lara, but her figure was still extremely boyish. She had dark brown hair which she wore in stylish long bangs that fell over her left eye. The hairstyle copied from a model she had seen in Mademoiselle. Large, serious eyes, a long, straight nose, that her mother said was her best feature, and lips that always seemed to be pounding. You shouldn't put yourself down. You look just like that actress Demi Moore, Lara had told her one day. Don't be ridiculous, Jenny had said, and then rushed home to look in the mirror and see if Lara was right. Laura is totally nuts, she told herself. But she was secretly pleased. Hi, Bob. Over here. The boy looked up as the bus started to move again. It wasn't Bob Tanner. He didn't look anything like Bob Tanner. Laura slumped down low in the seat and laughed. That's okay. I don't even like Bob Tanner. He's a creep. What? Why is he a creep? Jenny asked, glancing at her watch. 7.15. He thinks he's cool just because he's so tall. Lara was always accusing people of thinking they were cool just because they were tall. Hey, are you going to go out with Chuck? The question caught Jenny off guard. She'd been thinking about Chuck a lot, but she hadn't been able to decide anything. Oh, I don't know. He's such a goof. He's funny, Lara said. He's a total nutcase, Jenny agreed. Did you see him in the lunchroom today when he put the hard-boiled egg slices over his eyes? He was a riot. If I went out with him, he'd probably embarrass me to death, Jenny said, feeling embarrassed just thinking about Chuck and how he was always goofing on things. Did you see him dissecting that rubber chicken in biology? Laura went on, ignoring Jenny's negative attitude. I thought Mr. Holstrom was going to have a fit. The worst was the day we had the substitute teacher in McNally's class, Jenny said, shaking her head. Chuck convinced the poor woman that he was deaf, and then he kept talking to her in this dreadful phony sign language. We were all on the floor. She didn't know what was going on. I felt so sorry for her. Chuck had only been at Harrison High for a few weeks, but already he was a legendary class clown. When he had come up to Jenny at her locker after school and asked if she liked to go out sometime, she was startled. She hadn't ever really talked to him except to say hi in the halls or at the beginning of history class. She had put him off, saying she was very busy studying. Why had she been so reluctant? Because she was reluctant about everything? Because she likes to think about things first? To imagine what they would be like before she actually did them? Because she preferred imagining things to actually doing them? No, she was just a cautious person, that's all. Besides, why should she go out with such a goof? He'd probably spend the whole night showing off and trying to be funny. How boring. I don't know. If he asked me again, I might go out with him, she told Laura. She glanced at her watch again shook her head impatiently, and stared out the window at a lawn blanketed with shifting, tumbling brown leaves. The tall oaks and maples that bordered the yard were nearly bare. Winter was only a few weeks away. So you're going to babysit for these people twice a week? Lara asked. Yep, Thursdays and Saturdays. How'd you get this job, anyway? It was an accident, really, Jenny replied. I was at the mall last Saturday with my cousin Melanie. We were just hanging out, not shopping or anything. Then I saw this little boy. He was hard to miss. He had the most amazing blonde hair. It was almost pure white and very straight and shiny. He looked like the kind of kid you see only in TV commercials. He was by himself playing near the fountain and his toy tank fell into the water. He started to climb in after it. 
I shouted for him to stop. He didn't seem to be with anyone, and he wasn't paying any attention to my shouts. He got up on the ledge over the fountain and was about to jump in after his tank. I ran as fast as I could. That fountain's pretty deep. I grabbed him by the shoulders, picked him up, and pulled him away. He was pretty upset with me for stopping him, but he got over it as soon as I pulled his tank out of the water for him. He was the cutest kid I've ever seen. Big blue eyes, so big they didn't look real. Round cheeks and that amazing blonde hair. He thanked me and told me his name was Donnie. I asked him where his mom and dad were, and he just shrugged. He didn't seem to care. He told me he was six, but he seemed very sophisticated for six. Kids are sophisticated these days, Lara said. My nephew Eddie is only four, and he's already into girls. Well, he seemed just like a little adult to me, Jenny continued. He was so cute. Melanie had to leave, but I wanted to stay with him until his parents found him. He and I sat down by the fountain and had a nice talk, mostly about toys. I think he wanted to tell me every toy he had at home and every toy he wanted for Christmas. So then Donnie's parents came? Yeah, a few minutes later. And did they look relieved to see him? It turned out they'd been searching for him for nearly 20 minutes. They were frantic and he didn't even look up when they came. He just wanted to keep talking with me. Mr. Hagen introduced himself and his wife. Then he said, Well, you and Donnie really seem to have hit it off. Then Donnie asked if we could bring me home with him. We all laughed. Then Mr. Hagen said that actually they were looking for a babysitter, someone to come and stay with Donnie every Thursday and Saturday night. He asked if I might be interested in a job. Well, of course, I started to say no. Why? Laura asked. I don't know, because I always say no when I'm asked something the first time, I guess. I like time to think things over. But Donnie started begging me to say yes. He was so cute. And I knew Mom and I could really use the money. The Hagens seemed like okay people. So I said yes, I give it a try. Then Donnie started leaping up and down for joy and almost fell into the fountain again. Oh no, Laura suddenly jumped up. My stop. She lurched toward the front of the bus. Hey, stop, please, my stop. The bus driver slammed on the brakes. Laura saved herself from flying the rest of the way by grabbing a pole. She turned back to Jenny. Bye, call me later, good luck and she hopped down the steps and out the door. The bus pulled away. Jenny looked nervously at her watch. 7.25. No way she'd be there on time at 7.30. She stared into the dark glass and watched the houses glide by. It was a long ride from her house across town to the old village where the Hagens lived. She'd have to remember to leave earlier on Saturday night. If she was going to make this trip twice a week, she had to get the timing right. A few minutes later, the bus pulled into Millertown Road, and Jenny, still staring at her dark reflection in the glass window, nearly missed her stop. Suddenly realizing where she was, she pulled the bell cord and ran up to the front door, just as the driver was about to pull away. Bad start, she told herself, stepping down into the cool night air. She squinted up at the street signs, which were partially covered by low-hanging tree branches. Then, following the Hagen's directions, she turned right and headed down Edgetown Lane. Three blocks to go, she told herself. She started jogging. She was about ten minutes late. The houses she passed were old and very large, mostly colonial style, with wide, landscaped lawns and majestic old trees that bowed in the wind as if watching her pass by. The blocks were long. The houses gave way to woods. A small black dog came running up from behind her, yapping and sniffing at her sneakers as she ran. Go home, dog, go home, she said, already out of breath, a sense of dread growing from the pit of her stomach, slowing her steps making her legs feel as if they weighed a thousand pounds. Yipping excitedly, the dog gave a last snap, just missing her ankle, and turned back into the woods. She crossed the empty street. The Hagen's house should be the next block. She slowed to a walk and tried to catch her breath. On a corner stood a low ranch-style house, completely dark, the hedge ragged and overgrown, the leaves still unraked. That wasn't it. The wind picked up. Jenny pulled up the collar of her jean jacket and adjusted her backpack. She passed by a narrow lot of tangled trees and low brambles. Just past the lot, a mailbox on a pole jutted out into the street. Jenny was relieved to see the name Hagen painted on its side. She looked up the long driveway to the house. A porch light was on, casting pale white light against the dark, mottled shingles. The house was enormous, a rambling old Victorian. Even at first glance, it seemed run down. A loose shutter banged loudly against an upstairs window. Another shutter had fallen at an angle and was hanging by only one hinge. A window at the far end of the house had been broken, 
The hole filled in with balled up newspapers. Oh, great. The house is right out of a horror movie, Jenny thought. There's probably green slime pouring out of the walls. She looked at her watch. Fifteen minutes late. She didn't have time to be worrying about broken windows or green slime. She ran up the drive, the crunch of her sneakers on the gravel, the only sound except for the wind. She stepped into the white light of the porch, straightening her hair, pulling the long bangs down over her left eye, adjusted her backpack, cleared her throat, prepared a smile to greet the Hagens with, and rang the doorbell. The bell didn't work, so she knocked, having to bang with all her strength to make a sound against the hard, thick wood. She heard footsteps inside. Okay, kiddo, she told herself. Break a leg. Chapter 2 Come in, Jenny, come in. We were just starting to worry about you. Mr. Hagen pushed open the storm door and stepped aside so that Jenny could enter the narrow front hallway. Getting chilly out there. Is that jacket warm enough? Did you have trouble finding the place? No, sorry I'm late. The bus... Let me take your jacket, he interrupted, pulling at the sleeve before she could remove her backpack. The coat closet door is jammed shut, so I'll put it in our bedroom closet upstairs, okay? As you can see, the house needs a bit of work. We just moved in a few months ago. The house was built before the Civil War. Can you believe it? Well, I can. It looks as if no one did any work on it since then. Jenny laughed politely and struggled to get the jean jacket off. Didn't he ever take a breath? He seemed terribly nervous. Not at all like at the mall the weekend before. Mr. Hagen was a big man, so tall he had to stoop in a low entrance way. He was built wide with big shoulders and powerful looking hands. He was good-looking in a square-jawed, old-fashioned kind of way. He was wearing a charcoal gray suit which was snug against his broad chest. His dark hair was cut short, almost a crew cut, and thinning just a bit in front. His eyes were small and steel gray, and never seemed to stop darting about. His cheeks and ears were red, whether from excitement or nervousness or just a natural hue, Jenny couldn't tell. As he hurried off to take her jacket upstairs, Jenny noticed that he walked with a slight limp. She didn't remember that from the mall either, but of course she had only seen the Hagens for a few minutes there by the fountain. Oh, hi, Jenny. Where is Mike off to? Mrs. Hagen walked quickly into the hallway, her rimless glasses catching the overhead light and reflecting it so that her small face seemed to radiate light. She was tall and thin, sort of homey, down-to-earth looking, Jenny thought, with short, curly brown hair and those rimless glasses that hid her large brown eyes. She wore a simple white peasant blouse and a dark wraparound skirt, clothes that made her look older than she was. He took my jacket upstairs. Sorry I'm late. The bus? Oh, that's okay. We have plenty of time. Don't pay any attention to Mike. He's always nervous on the nights we go out. No, change that. He's always nervous. Period. But you'll get used to him. I heard that, Mr. Hagen called from the top of the stairway. Where's Donnie? Jenny asked, picking her backpack up off the floor. He's in the den watching a tape. Ghostbusters, I think. He's seen it six hundred times. He says it's awesome. She laughed. It's funny how all these trendy words and phrases, you know, words like awesome, about two years after they've gone out of style. I keep waiting for Donnie to tell me that some movie is real groovy, but that word hasn't caught up with him yet. Or maybe it passed him by. I was a linguistics major, believe it or not, so I'm very interested in words and how they travel. Really, Jenny said. Then she felt like a jerk. Really? Was that the best she could do? Really? Hey, Donnie, look who's here, Mrs. Hagen called. Jenny followed her through the large, cluttered living room. The living room furniture seemed as ranshackle and run down as the rest of the house. The sofa cushions didn't exactly match, and a large, peach-colored, overstuffed armchair had one arm that appeared to be held in place with masking tape. Don't mind the furniture, Mrs. Hagen said catching the surprised look on Jenny's face. We inherited it with the house. We're redoing the hall room as soon as Mike gets established at his new job. She continued to the den and motioned for Jenny to follow her in. Donnie, look who's here to stay with you. Donnie was lying on his stomach on the carpet in front of the TV. He didn't look up. Quiet, he said. This is the good part. Venkman is going to get it. Donnie, don't be rude, Mrs. Hagen said. You can at least look up from the TV for one second and say hi to Jenny. Hi, Donnie said without looking away from the screen. I guess the romance is over. How quickly they forget, Jenny said with mock sadness. Mrs. Hagen laughed. He's impossible, she said. No, I'm not, Donnie muttered, engrossed in Vegman's battle against the slimy green ghost. 
We're going to be late, Mr. Hagen said impatiently, bursting into the den and shoving his wife's coat at her. Donnie, you have to go to bed when the movie's over. Ah, Dad, I didn't have any time to play. Can I stay up just a little? Well, maybe a little, but you have to listen to what Jenny tells you. Mr. Hagen turns to Jenny. His ears and cheeks were bright scarlet. I'm sorry I didn't have a chance to show you around. I'm sure you won't have any trouble. Donnie can give you the grand tour after his movie. I'll be fine, Jenny said, looking at Donnie. We won't be too late, Mr. Hagen continued, talking rapidly. I left a number where we can be reached in the kitchen. Call if you have any problem at all. Donnie can show you how to operate the VCR if you want to watch a tape or something. We're not expecting any phone calls, but in case... Really, Mike, Mrs. Hagen scolded. I'm sure Jenny has babysat before, haven't you, dear? Yes, of course, Jenny said, giving them her most confident smile. Here comes a good part, Donnie shouted over several loud explosive blasts from the movie soundtrack. Awesome! Awesome! Well, if you have any problems at all, the number is on the pad by the phone in the kitchen, Mr. Hagen continued undaunted. Donnie will show you where the kitchen is, and by all means, be sure to keep all the doors locked. Did you read in the paper about the attacks on babysitters in this town? He shook his head sadly and sighed. Some world we live in. I saw it on the news, Jenny said softly. Some creep in a ski mask was breaking into homes and beating up babysitters. So far, there have been two attacks. Both babysitters had had to be hospitalized. After she saw the news stories, Jenny decided not to take the job with the Hagens. Her imagination ran wild and she pictured hideous, horrifying scenes. But then she forced herself to think about it clearly. What were the chances the attacker would choose the Hagen's house way over on the far end of town? One in ten thousand? No, one in a million. If I keep the doors locked, I'll be perfectly safe, she told herself. And besides, she really needed the money. Mike, why on earth did you have to bring that up? Are you trying to make Jenny nervous on her first night? Come on, you said more than enough. Move on out. Mrs. Hagen gave Jenny a conspiratorial wink and shoved her husband hard from behind. He didn't budge. It was like trying to move a tank. Good night, Donnie. Be good, both parents called as they headed to the front door. Donnie didn't reply. Jenny slipped into a soft white leather armchair against the wall. You're sitting awfully close, she told Donnie. His face was only a few inches from the screen. I'm allowed, he said. He watched the movie for a while. Jenny watched with him. She just couldn't get over his beautiful blonde hair. It was so smooth and wonderfully shaped like a perfect golden ball. So shiny. So fine. Do you like Ghostbusters? he asked. I haven't seen it for a few years, she told him. The front door slammed. The Hagens had left. Donnie turned away from the TV screen and actually looked at Jenny for the first time. Did they leave? he asked, looking concerned. Yes, she told him. They just left. Good, he said. Can I have a candy bar? Getting Donnie to bed wasn't as hard as Jenny had predicted. He was a very lively, active kid, and when he finally got tired, he just suddenly crashed, his energy all used up, barely enough strength left to keep his eyelids up. Jenny took him up to his room and tucked him in. See you on Saturday night, she whispered, running her hand tenderly through his amazing hair. He was nearly asleep before she turned out the light and crept out of the room. The carpet on the stairs was worn right through to the wood in several places. The stairs creaked beneath her feet as she descended to the living room. What a creepy old place. Why did people think it was neat to live in 200-year-old houses? When I have my own home, Jenny decided, it's going to be sparkling and brand new. She stopped in the living room to look around. Everything smelled so musty. The floor creaked as she walked. A tall mahogany grandfather's clock in the corner ticked, then talked loudly, insistently. I'd go nuts if I had to listen to that all day, Jenny thought. She suddenly imagines the original owners of the house, sitting by the fire, listening to the tick-tocking of the big clock. The ghostly pale woman was dressed in black, except for a white bonnet on her head and a gray wool shawl over her shoulders. She sat knitting another gray wool shawl. The man was also dressed in black. He had a long white beard and mustache. He stood by the fireplace, staring at an enormous, dripping red hog being roasted on a spit in the fireplace. Just think, he said softly, more than a hundred years from now, that clock of ours is going to drive whoever's in this house bananas. Bam! A loud banging noise made Jenny jump. Her fantasy old-time couple vanished. What was that? Then she remembered the loose shutter on the front of the house. 
She walked to the window, pushed back the heavy crushed velvet drapes, and looked out. The darkness seemed thick enough to touch. Swaying trees were black shadows against the black sky. The house appeared to be surrounded by woods. She couldn't see another house, another car, another sign of human life. Her eyes adjusted to the darkness outside, but there was only more darkness to see. She shivered. It was drafty by the window. One of the panes was cracked, and cold air was seeping in all around the window frame. Somewhere not too far away an animal howled. Was it a dog? Please, she thought, let it be a dog. The shutter banged again, harder this time. Again she jumped. She stepped back and rearranged the heavy drapes. Tick, tock, tick, tock. The annoying clock seemed to grow louder. She heard a soft cracking sound above her head. The house groaned and shifted as the winds picked up outside. Take it easy, she told herself. All old houses make weird sounds. She was sorry she had put Donnie to bed. The noises weren't so loud or frightening when he was around. When she was playing with him, she didn't have time to think about where she was, all alone in this creepy old house, surrounded by nothing but dark woods. She looked up at the wall above the mantel. A hideous moose head, its fur caked with dust and mold, seemed to glare down at her. The grandfather's clock chimed loudly. Nine o'clock. Tick, tock, tick, tock. Its pendulum swinging quickly back and forth, clicking the time away. Jenny decided to check out the kitchen. She turned toward the hall, and something grabbed her leg.